Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Sunday service. It's really great to be able to gather again uh, this morning. Um, if it's your first time joining us, um, we are, you're so welcome. Um, please do uh, yeah, join in with the comments. Let us know you're, you're watching with us. Um, it'd be great to connect with you. Um, and if you'd like to connect with us more permanently, please do send us a message. Um, and uh, yeah, we would love to, to um, yeah, get to know you uh, and connect with you in some way. Uh, we're going to uh, sing to kick off our service, um, but I'm just going to say um, a quick opening prayer um, before we start. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Let's worship together.
searching. Help us to lay aside all that prevents us from seeking your kingdom and to give all that we have to gain the pearl beyond all price. Through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. So now let's join in the words of the Creed. Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God, the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Christ. When Jesus came to the region, of Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, when whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. 
So this morning we're in Matthew 16, if you want to get your Bibles open, and we pick up in verse 13 with Jesus coming into the region of Caesarea Philippi. This is about two days walk from the main base of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. So a bit of background on Caesarea Philippi. Uh, first off, this was firmly pagan territory. I don't mean to be derogatory in saying that, just to acknowledge that you know, they were not worshipping Yahweh, the God of Israel. They worshipped other gods instead. And Caesarea Philippi became the, the religious centre for the worship of the Greek god Pan. In fact, most people at that time knew this town as Panias or Panias, uh, named after Pan. And the cliff that stood above the city was full of shrines built to Pan. Now, Pan was a, a fertility god, famous for sexuality and seduction, and basically associated with a, a kind of hookup culture, to the point where promiscuous girls at the time were known locally as Pan girls. But here's the really interesting thing about Pan. Pan is the only Greek god to ever die. And it just so happens that Pan is said to have died during the reign of Tiberius Caesar, who was the Caesar when Jesus was born. Isn't that interesting? Pan dies as Jesus was born. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, one more key feature of Caesarea Philippi is that there was a, a cave at the foot of the cliff with a spring of water coming from it. Now, the pagan view was that kind of their fertility gods lived in the underworld during the winter and then they returned each spring and they saw water as a symbol of the underworld. So they thought that their gods travelled to and from the underworld through the caves. So to the pagan mind then, the cave and the spring water at Caesarea Philippi created a kind of gate to the underworld. They believed their city was literally at the gates of Hades. This is the heart of the pagan world. And Jesus comes here to ask the question that will shape the rest of what happens in Matthew's Gospel. So let's look through, uh, through the passage bit by bit. So Matthew 16, kicking off with verse 13, where Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say the Son of Man is? Now, Son of Man is, is quite a cryptic phrase from Daniel 7 and one or two other places in the Old Testament, and it's not exactly clear. It doesn't have a precise meaning. So we don't know what Jesus means by it, but I guess that's kind of the point, that Jesus wants them and us to figure out who he really is by engaging with him. So verse 14, the disciples reply, well, some say you're John the Baptist, you're back from the dead because well, there's so many similarities. Others are saying Elijah and the last bit of the prophecy of, of Malachi, there's this line about the return of Elijah. So Jesus is a good candidate. Uh, for being Elijah. Or Jeremiah, uh, you know, one of the major prophets. Again, loads of similarities. Others just say that, well, you're one of the prophets. Either way, people are realising that, that Jesus is more than just a smart teacher, a smart rabbi. Verses 15 and 16. But what about you? Who do you say I am? Jesus asks. And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Let's break that down. You are the Christ. Now, Christ is, is not a last name. It's not Mr. Jesus Christ. Christ is a title. We get our word Christ from the Greek word Christos, which itself comes from a Hebrew word Meshiach or Messiah. So Christ, Messiah, and it means anointed one or anointed king. The Christ was the coming king, based in all the prophecies of the Old Testament, uh, who would be coming to set people free and usher in a rule of peace and justice. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, living God is probably a dig at Pan at this point. Remember the local fertility God, the one who died? You know, so Peter's saying something like, you're the son of God, the, the living God, that is, not the dead one. Now, Peter doesn't have a concept of the Trinity with the Father, the Son and the Spirit. You know, that understanding comes much later. But Peter here is recognising that Jesus somehow shares in the life of the Father in a way that is different. You are the Son of the living God. And then verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon, 
In other words, good answer. That kind of insight, you didn't get that off Google or Facebook, that kind of insight has come from God himself. And then verse 18, Jesus continues, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. There's loads going on in this verse. First off, Peter. Peter is a bit like Christ in that it wasn't really a name that existed at that time. It was just a word, the word for rock. So Jesus is saying, you are the rock and on this rock I will build my church. And that means there's a kind of symmetry in this passage. Simon declares, Jesus, you are the Christ. And then Jesus declares, Simon, you are the rock. Peter's title or role is to be the first stone in the building of the church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome that church. Now, Hades is the place of death and evil. And now remember, they're in Caesarea Philippi. Maybe they can even see the cave in the background, the gates of Hades. And Jesus says to them, even the gates of death can't withstand the church. All the powers of evil and death will not stand up against the advance of the church. Verse 19, and he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. At that time, the, the master of a household would give keys to the top servant uh, who would be in charge. And it was a real role of honour. And it's like Jesus is saying to Simon Peter, I'm giving you authority and the right to unlock the door and to welcome people into my house and into the kingdom of God. And if we look in the book of Acts, we see that that's exactly what Peter does. He welcomes a whole load of Jews into the kingdom and then a whole load of Gentiles and others into God's kingdom as well. But alongside that, Peter's also given responsibility for binding and loosing, not just welcoming people in, but also being clear about who actually is following Jesus and, and who isn't. Binding and loosing was common language for allowing or not allowing someone into a community. We welcome you or we bind you. Now that doesn't mean Peter has absolute power necessarily. The best translation of this line is actually more like this. Uh, whatever you tie up on earth will have been tied up in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in, in heaven. So the idea is that when Peter makes a decision on earth, that decision will already have been made in heaven. So it's not Jesus promising to just endorse every decision Peter ever makes. It's more a promise that, that every decision he makes will be guided with heaven's resources. And so Peter has this responsibility to, to guard the parameters of the kingdom of God, to say to people, that's not how we do things, or that is how we do things. Kind of setting the house rules for being the family of God. And then verse 20, Jesus warns them not to tell anyone. That's really smart. Jesus being the Christ, this coming king, questions every other power and authority that exists. Jesus is a threat to the power brokers of the day. And as soon as this news gets out, they're going to try and kill him. Now Jesus is up for that. He knows where it's heading, but he has more work to do first. So he encourages them, just don't tell anyone yet. It's a lot in this story. The entire story is built around the question, who do you say I am? Everything uh, before Matthew chapter 16 leads up to this question and everything afterwards flows from the answer to it. You are the Christ, the coming king. And just like in Matthew's day, there are there are all sorts of ideas out there about who Jesus is today. Loads of people still try and say that he's just a good teacher or he's a healer or a revolutionary or a holy man or a prophet or a, you know, a do-gooder. Who do you say Jesus is? How you answer that question will define you. It's been said that the most important thing about you is your vision of God. Who do you say Jesus is? Now we're in chapter 16 of Matthew before Jesus asks his disciples this question. He doesn't just rock up on day one saying, I'm the Messiah, get with the programme. He announces the kingdom of God 
And then he does the kind of things you'd expect the Messiah to do. And then he gives them and us time to see who he is for ourselves. But there comes a time when Jesus will ask you that question. Who do you say I am? Some of you watching this this morning, you're not at that question yet. Maybe you're exploring and you're, you're asking questions and you're finding out who Jesus is. If that's you, I'd encourage you to keep at it, to keep trying the way of Jesus. Join us for Alpha and come and ask your questions and find out more. But others of you have been exploring this for a while already. And it's time to answer the question. Who do you say Jesus is? Is Jesus the king? In which case, surrender your life to him. Or isn't he? Let me finish with this. Simon was a humble fisherman. But when he gave his allegiance to Jesus, he became the rock. He had a role to play in the movement of God's kingdom. And so do we. We won't all be the rock. But this morning, some of us have a role to play and God is calling you to step up and we need you to do that. We're going to respond in, in worship just now. And it's a chance this morning for us to recognise afresh Jesus as King. But also as we do that, to receive our role from him. To invite God to speak to us about the role we have to play. So let's respond together now let's acknowledge afresh this morning if you're ready to that Jesus is the king of kings that he is the Christ the chosen one of God the one who came to bring in the rule and the reign of God and invites us to give uh, give him our allegiance so as we sing as we worship together let's choose in our hearts afresh to do that this morning and if you're already living in a place of allegiance to Christ then why not ask him during uh, this song about the, the role and the purpose that you have to play in his kingdom Jesus come by your spirit now we pray and minister to us meet with us as we worship together
posture can be so important as we worship. I just have a sense as we're singing this that for some of us, what we need to do is physically bow. It might just be kind of bowing your head as you sit, or it might be that you want to just get up and, and lie down on the floor, face down before the King of Kings. So wherever you are right now, if that's a response you need to make, I encourage you to do that. Jesus, we recognize afresh that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We choose to serve you this morning, to live for you, to bow our all before you. To say that you first in our lives, the first allegiance. Let us pray for the church and the world and let's thank God for his goodness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your guidance through the last few weeks and months of uncertainty. Give wisdom to those in authority who are helping to make all the decisions of the country and help them to make the right decisions at the right time. We pray for other countries who do not have the health care that we do um, and struggling to cope and we thank you for all the aid agencies and that are helping them. We pray for our NHS and we thank you for all they have done and we pray for the ongoing work as they get back to a normal routine. We pray for the teachers and the pupils and parents going back to face-to-face -face education in September and we pray that they will not be anxious and you will calm any anxiousness they do feel. We thank you that we are free to share our faith, Lord, and we ha ask you for the courage to do that. We pray for Matt and the leadership team of St Matt's and for all the church family and we pray for a time when we can all be together face to face again. We pray for those who are sick at this time Lord and we ask that for your comfort for them. We thank you for the doctors and nurses and all the healthcare workers. We pray for those who have died Lord and we thank you, ask your comfort for the bereaved. Lord in your mercy hear our prayer. Lastly can we all join in the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. Amen.
cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body in tears they laid him down in Joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone oh praise the worshipping with us this morning. It's been great to have you with us. A final prayer of blessing. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.